Hello, everybody, and welcome to Conversations with Vegan Women Leaders. I'm your host, Katrina Fox, and I am so delighted to have our special guest today, the one and only Kathy Freston. Now, most of you, I'm sure, will have heard of Kathy as she is a renowned New York Times bestselling author of multiple health and wellness books, including The Lean, Quantum Wellness, and Clean Protein. Her advocacy for a more healthy, sustainable and just food system is inspired by her concern for human health as well as animal and environmental welfare. Kathy appears frequently on national television, including Ellen, Dr. Oz, Good Morning America, The Talk, Extra and Oprah. And her work has been featured in multiple media outlets, including Vanity Fair, Harper's Bazaar, Self Fitness and The Huffington Post. Her latest book with Jean Stone is 72 Reasons to be Vegan. Kathy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, I'm delighted. It's been a while. I've kind of watched you from afar. And I think we, we were just talking about it. we exchanged an email back in 2016. But this is the first time we've actually kind of spoken with words. Like, <laughs> so I'm very I, I happy. It took that, that long, but I'm so glad we're finally together. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I was reading a bit about you and I, I didn't realize actually that you actually used to go hunting with a boyfriend, I believe. And now, of course, you've become this amazing, prolific, passionate vegan spokesperson. So I would love for you to just tell us a little bit about that time. Can you take us back to that time, like when you were going hunting, like what were you thinking? What were you experiencing? And how did you get from there to, you know, being a very passionate vegan? Wow, you took me right back there. <laughs> so um, back 187 years ago, I, <laughs> I, I lived in Woodstock, New York, and I had a boyfriend who used to go hunting and fishing. And, uh, and I, I went with him. Uh, we went uh, pheasant hunting and we went trout fishing. And we fished all across the country um, and I did not think anything about it, to tell you the truth. I thought I was in the great outdoors. I thought I was connected to nature, connected to the cycle of life. Um, I didn't actually shoot the gun ever, but and I was really bad with a fishing rod. So I was kind of along for the hike and uh, the beautiful walks. But so he would he had his dog blue with us and he would we would, you know, go through the, the, the fields and the, and the mountains and, and scaring up pheasant. And, uh, he would, and, and grouse, I believe as well. And he would, um, shoot the birds and his dog would go and collect the bird. And Katrina, I want to tell you that my heart sank every time, but I didn't feel, I just didn't feel it. I don't know. I, I really was in that mindset of like, look at us, we're, we're so down to earth, we're into the, you know, great outdoors, and this is what people do. Um, and then he would cook up the feather, he would do the thing to the poor bird, and he would cook it up, and, and we would have pheasant cacciatore, and we'd be careful of the, the little pellets that were from the shotgun and everything. And um, I just, and I, I, I talk about this, and I share this, not because in any way that I'm proud of my process, I thank God for, you know, waking up for sure. But I share it because I think it's important for us to remember as vegans and as activists where we came from. It's so easy to just want to shout from the rooftops like, look at what you're doing. It's wrong. And if someone shouted me at me from the rooftops back then and says, look at what, look at what you're doing, you're wrong. I would have rejected it. And I have to remember where I was, what I was able to hear, and what would have worked and what did work with me when I finally woke up. So I share that just to say that we all, just to remember as activists that we didn't pop out of the womb being, you know, ethical vegans. I mean, maybe some people did, but it's very rare. And I certainly didn't. So I have I have compassion for whoever I'm talking with, who I want to advocate for animals or for the vegan movement. I, I really try to empathize about where they are in their process of, um, you know, taking this in and really giving it some credence. 
Mm, I love that. And that's one of the reasons I asked you, particularly because you mentioned, you you know, you went along with the hunting because it's one thing to kind of, you know, we all get caught up with, you know, the propaganda from the, you know, the animal ag industry to eat meat, but to actually mm. go from hunting to, uh, you know, becoming a vegan, I think is, is, is great. I love it. I love that, you know, that people can do that. And I think it is important, like you said, to, mm. to remember, you know, particularly when we've been as vegan as long as we have, it can be easy um to forget so um yeah i really appreciate you um there's so much, there's so much in the movement now where people are shaming other people that they're not vegan enough that they should be more perfect that, that it, they should jump from a to z and i actually get a lot of flack from that because i always talk about leaning in finding your way it's okay to be veganish it's okay to be imperfect because if we don't allow people that room to find their way to find their footing they they shut down. If I thought I had to be 100% vegan, perfect right away, I would have been so overwhelmed. It would have been impossible. And I would have never gone down that road. But because I allowed myself the space and time to figure it out, then it stuck. And so now I am 100% vegan. As I've talked about in my Instagram posts, I'm not, you know, perfect. You know, sometimes I realize I have a pair of jeans that has a leather tag on it. And I, you know, feel bad. But it's like, let's allow ourselves to make some mistakes, get back you know, on this path and do the best we can and to advocate for animals and the, and, and the planet and of course humans in as kind a way as we can. So that means being kind to ourselves, kind to our fellow humans as they find their way as well. Mm-hmm. I love that. And I was going to ask you about that, the whole veganish. And I think you've even got a, a book with mm-hmm. veganish in the title and you do speak out on, on social media a lot. And as you mentioned, you get a lot of flack. How do you handle that, particularly on social media? You know, you get a lot of obviously passionate people, shall we say, <laughs> being polite. Um, how do you handle that? And do you have any advice, you know, particularly maybe for younger women in particular who maybe are going down this path? Because everyone knows, you know, obviously, particularly women get attacked, you know, that you need to have a voice and it's, you know, you can get shouted down. Any tips on how you handle that? Well, I think it's um, through empathy to begin with. I, I feel like someone who's shouting down and trying to shame someone is in a lot of pain and they are probably traumatized by what they've seen and rightfully so. I think all of us as activists are traumatized by what we've seen. That's why we've become activists. Um, it is horrible what happens to animals as they become food. It is nothing less than horrendous and traumatizing, obviously to them, but to anyone who witnesses it. So I think when someone is shouting me down and saying really nasty things, I I try to understand they are traumatized and they are trying desperately to change things. And I understand that because there's a piece of me that wants to be that too. There's a piece of me that's in a restaurant that I wanna like scream at someone next to me who's eating a steak or pork chops or, you know, God forbid foie gras or whatever. I, I want I want to I want to scream at them and I wanna say, do you know what you're doing? But then I have to think, okay, what's what's the end game here? What is what let's keep our eye on the prize and the prize is a vegan world, a better, you know, moving toward a vegan world. And that that means like we have to be strategic. We have to talk to people in a way that is going to connect. So so my advice is to first understand where people are coming from and then to speak into it in a way that has a, my firm boundaries. Like, uh, and I always say, if you're trying to pick a fight, I'm not your gal. And I tend to um, do a copy and paste comment explaining my philosophy, which is I want to help people find their way into veganism. And I believe that progress rather than perfection is the way to go. So that's my strategy. And I appreciate that you're so passionate, but I'm not willing to pick a fight. And I just copy and paste it into my uh, comments in Instagram or Facebook or wherever I'm getting the pushback so that other people in the community can see I'm addressing it. I'm not just ignoring it and I'm not right. fighting back. I don't, why, I don't wanna fight back because that's just adding unkindness into the world. So there, there's a, there's a, um, it's, you have to grow a thick skin. You know, first of all, I had to grow a thick skin when I became vegan because everyone around me was, was a, you know, meat eater and defensive about it. And, you know, would throw out all kinds of, you know, challenges like, uh, you know, 
you know, I don't know, some kind of crazy, obscure health thing that I didn't have the answer to, or, you know, before I had given up wearing leather, they, you know, say, well, if you're not going to eat a steak, what's that where, you know, on your feet that you're wearing? And so, and I don't wear leather anymore, but it, it, it was a process. So I, I had to grow a thick skin with that. Like people saying that I was, you know, an idiot and I didn't know my facts and I didn't know my science. And then I realized that it is, that's okay because we as humans, that's what we do. We, we get defensive before we open up. And so I, I, I understand it and I just grow a thick skin and I try to speak into it with as much kindness um as i can possibly have with boundaries you know not 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 nas- not you know boundaries like oh you can't talk to me that way but just boundaries of like i'm not going to engage in this i'm just not going to engage in this i believe in yeah. kindness and that includes between humans and to myself so i'm not going to mm. I love that. It's a really, really great strategy. What do you say to people? And we see this often, so I'm curious to get your take on it, particularly vegan and, and you know, some vegan and animal rights activists will say to things like initiatives like um, Meatless Monday, for example, mm-hmm. um, you know, rather than support, they'll say, yeah, but you wouldn't do that with any other social justice cause. Like you wouldn't say to people, oh, well, just be anti-sexist one day of the week, you know, and do what you want the rest of the week or, you know, stuff like that. What, do you, what would be your response to that? I'm curious how you... Well, I would say that that uh, that it they're different movements, and I would say that um, judging from what people are going through, they're not going to go a hundred percent vegan overnight. It's just not going to happen. So, if you want to hold out for perfection, you could hold out, you know, until hundreds of years later, and the animals suffer for that. I I, I just think that progress rather than perfection works. I'm a big believer in that of leaning in. And I think that leaning in, you know, <clears throat> begets more momentum. And, um, you know, I just, I, I, I just can't, I, you, you, well, the research will show you just, most people will not go vegan overnight. And if they do, they tend, there's a lot of recidivism. The recidivism is <clears throat> they don't feel good. <clears throat> they don't know how to eat. They're frustrated. So like, it's, oh, I just can't do this. It's too hard. Um, they feel like they don't fit in anymore. So I think that those people going back, I, I would prefer to let people find their way, help them find their way, um, of course, as, as speedily as possible, but with as much gentleness and allowance as possible, and then it sticks. I know that if I, I, I could have gone vegan overnight, <clears throat> but I doubt it would have stuck. And now it's, for me, it's stuck for over 16 years now, so it worked. Nice, nice, I love it. Now, health and wellness, obviously, very important to you but I know there's different aspects in when most people think of health and wellness I think we often think of oh eat the right foods and exercise you know move your body but you've got uh, you talk about some other aspects in your work can you just touch on those to give us a bit of a broader perspective on the importance for health and wellness yeah well and besides healthy relating this kind of um you know being kind and having empathy and respecting people's dignity and having as much integrity as we can in our discourse I think that's really important because relating, I I think Dr. Melanie Joy talks about this a lot, is that healthy relating is sort of the uh, foundation of all of these movements. Because if we don't have that relational literacy and we don't talk to each other with this um, dignity and integrity, the message is lost. So I think that's really important on an emotional level. I also am a big uh, believer in meditation because I think it brings us into a very grounded place, a place that we can Um, quiet the uh, noise, the monkey mind and all that stuff. And when we come from that grounded place, we can connect better with people. We can hear our own voice and be guided by our own internal truth. So I think that's really important. And I think wellness is also uh, a sense of our use or usefulness in the world. Like, you know, what is our purpose? How are we living out our truth? How are we living out our mission in the world? And that that makes you feel really good. It makes you when you when you plug into and believe me, I know not everybody has the um, opportunity to find uh, that purpose and live it in their work. I mean, people a lot of people have to just pay the bills, and I completely understand that. But we can still live our purpose within our homes, what we serve for food, how we act with each other, you know, at stores on the street, all of that stuff. So, I think it's really important. <clears throat> all of that is body, mind, and soul. There's not, it's not just about what we eat. 
It's not just about how we meditate because there's a lot of meditators and <laughs> so-called spiritual people who are, you know, eat anything and they're not conscious about what they eat and they're not conscious about that, how they relate to people. So I think it's, if we can take this well-rounded approach um, and coming always from integrity, dignity, kindness, I think applying that to our food, applying that to our relationships, whether it's romance, work, friendship, um, and ourselves, then we, we, we become healthy, well people in the world. Mm. I love that. Now, Jix, you mentioned kind of you know, spiritual people. I know you've been on Oprah. You've been on obviously a lot of the big shows. You've been on Oprah, and I love Oprah. I listen to Super Soul Sunday a lot. I know you've been on it, and you know you were on a show. I think back in I think it was two thousand and eight, and they had the chef, and you were on there and helping. And and Oprah's kind of you know she's done you know she's tried vegan. She says she loves animals. You know she loves her dogs. She often mentions them. I'm curious, why do you think that people you know in that realm, you know particularly you know there's the spiritual realm who are otherwise you know so compassionate really smart really insightful and not making or somehow can't or unable to make that switch to 100 percent vegan any thoughts on that you know i certainly can't get into the mind of anybody else and i would i i i don't i really don't know what drives someone to um, make decisions and act on them and and what keeps them from them i don't know but i do know people like oprah are real vegan allies and they brought a lot of attention to the, the movement and to um, animals and what they go through. So even if she's chosen not to be vegan, she's brought so much attention to it. <clears throat> she's had people on her show like Nicholas Kristoff, mm -hmm. who talked about, you know, raising chickens. And she's talked about she's talked to various leaders about it. She's had me on a couple of times talking about this. So I really consider her an ally to the movement. And um, and I think that's great. And and I and I can't get inside someone's head to know what motivates them or or keeps them from doing certain things. Yeah. Do you think we'll see more of a movement, like particularly in the kind of the spiritual realm? I know, like Victoria Moran's got a film that she produced around, you know, kind of talking to people in that realm who are, you know, starting to wake up to, uh, you know, in, encompassing animals in their circle of compassion. Yeah, I think it's inevitable. I think you can't really call yourself a spiritual leader if you're not looking under the hood of where your food comes from and asking yourself, does this sit right in my soul? I don't care what religion you are, what, what spiritual practice you have. There is something that we can feel inside of us and say, is this okay with me? Am I at peace with this? Does this the best expression of my, my very being, you know, can you look into the eyes of an animal and say, mm, my taste craving is more important than your life and your experience and your fear? So I think ultimately that's going to um, arrive in every spiritual leader's mind and heart. It's just a matter of time if they're seriously um, committed to their own spiritual practice. I think it's yeah. inevitable. Yeah, I love that. Wonderful. Let's talk a bit about relationships. I know you you have a, you wrote a book a, a while back on that. I think it was called Finding the One. And so you were married to Tom Freston since 1998. You divorced in 2012, which was, I think, six years after writing the book about finding your soulmate. So I'm curious, what did you or what have you learned about love and relationships since then that you've been able to perhaps bring into any future relationships or just kind of more mm. about, you know, love in general? Because I'm really curious about your perspectives on on love. Well, I think love is is love and it sometimes changes form. So, you know, when you love someone as a romantic partner, um, two people are always growing and hopefully they grow in the same manner and they they are on the same path and it you know works together but sometimes people do grow in different directions for whatever reasons but the love is still there and and certainly for my ex-husband and me the love is is still there it just changed forms so i think if we respect the person that we've spent so much time with and we we really honor their their uh, dignity then then we it, it it's hopefully two people it takes two people obviously if one person isn't willing to do that it won't work but um you know i i love the whole conscious uncoupling idea that that gwyneth paltrow started i think that's really brilliant because it's like a real process of saying i love you neither one of us is wrong we both grew in these different directions, but you know we have a respect for each other. We honor each other. We have a history together, and and so we we can move forward. And um, and I think a soulmate, and that's what I talk about in the one and um, 
and is uh, an expected miracle is that it's not about finding this one person. It's about finding yourself, finding your oneness with the, um, with the world, with, with your, the, you know, at one with yourself, when you're at one with yourself, you can be uh, connected to another person. So all we can really do is work on ourselves. We can't change somebody else. God knows <laughs> I've tried to change people. <laughs> no matter what. Um, so, so all I can do is work on myself. And then I think it's a matter of resonance. You know, it's who you resonate with. And if someone else is interested in, you know, travel all over the world and you're more of a homebody, it's probably not going to resonate. It's not a matter of you're bad, I'm good or vice versa or anything like that. But just to recognize that, OK, we've had a beautiful journey and um, and now it's time to go in different directions. And uh, if we can just remember that and and not traumatize each other because the world is traumatizing enough. You know, we don't need to do this to each other. And um, it's it's a process. Yeah, I love that. I love what you said about, and what you touched on there about finding your best self in a relationship rather than relying on another person mm. to fix you or, you know, or to complete you. You know, that whole thing about saying, oh, I found my other half or, yeah. you know. No, but I do think that that other people in our lives who we're attracted to, and I think it is like that magical attraction I think they bring out the stuff in us that needs to be healed or the part of us that wants to grow. It's like, okay, somewhere in me, my soul knows I need to work on this. I need to grow here. And certain people just catalyze that growth. And that that's a gift. And it's sometimes a very difficult gift. It's a dark angel. Um, I certainly had a dark angel in my life who, you know, it was what the you know, dark, dark night in my soul, but it, it drove me to so much healing. It drove me to really um, uncover all the stuff that I needed to look at that I'd never looked at. It, it drove me to uh, take responsibility where I had not to face my fears, um, to be honest about who I was, um, to become vulnerable. And so, so that, that dark angel of a partner really was very healing. And I think that if we can approach things like, okay, what, what am I in the deepest reaches of my being? What am I trying to learn here? And so rather than just going through it over and over on rote and just trying to change that person and get what you want, it's like, okay, I, I need to learn something here. So what is it? Yeah. And were you able to do that, Kathy, within the relationship or was it something you did afterwards and you, you realized? Because that can be quite tricky when you're working on yourself. Relationship. This is not within yeah. marriage. I'm not talking about my marriage, but another yeah. relationship before that. And uh, no, I, I went into the 12 step program, you know, which is Al, I did Al Anon and uh, ACA, Adult Children of Alcoholics. Not that my parents were alcoholics, but, you know, um, it was just a very helpful process. I think I did um, back in the day, it was called Women Who Love Too Much 12 step meetings. Oh, all right. So, all of these things, it, because I was so desperate and so much in so much pain that going to a meeting every day, I think I did a 90 90 at one point, which means 90 meetings in 90 days. And it's an, wow. an excellent spiritual program because they really, uh, you know, have the infrastructure for you to examine your life and to, you know, take responsibility for it and keep pushing yourself forward. And I, I think, so while I was in the relationship, I was healing myself and I got to a point where I was strong enough and clear enough to leave. And so, and then of course I kept, kept going with that, um, trajectory of growth. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So what's happening at the moment? You've had, it's been 2020, obviously you've been in lockdown. How have you handled COVID? What's, what's life been like for you? Well, I've been so lucky, <clears throat> you know, I've been so lucky. There's so many people who, uh, just freaking they're on the front lines and they weren't able to sort of isolate in the way that I was. And I, I, I feel bad saying, uh, you know, that I, I was okay, but I, I just locked down. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, I have some, I have family that I live with and we just locked down and, um, and kept our heads down and worked and cooked and, you know, kept as safe as we could. And uh, so now, you know, that's over. Well, it's over in 
California for the most part, Los Angeles, where I live, it's really gone down, down, down. So yeah, we, it's like passing through another, um, you know, dark night collectively. So hopefully we're, we're nearing, nearing the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, for sure. And I know you've spoken about, let's talk a bit about your, your writing, obviously you're a prolific author, as we've, we've mentioned. Um, and I think you've mentioned before, in, in some ways, writing can be a quiet kind of job or career, like when you're actually um, in it. So I, I guess, I don't know, maybe it was, I'm not saying necessarily it's easier, but I guess, you know, if you're used to being at home, I know for some people, if they were yeah. working and used to being social at the office, and then suddenly they were at home. Whereas yeah. I think maybe for people like you and I, we're kind of used to being at home with our computers. Um, but <laughs> it I wonder if you... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so can you talk, tell us a little bit about your writing process, both kind of the day to day. So in terms of articles, like, you know, do you spend time, you know, kind of pitching articles to to outlets or do you just get commissioned nowadays? How, how does that kind of look? I don't really write articles anymore. I, I wrote a lot for the Huffington Post. Um, and then I, I, you know, I just felt like I, I wrote so much. I got tired of doing that. Now I just write books. Um, but I, sometimes I'll test, uh, you know, a chapter or something by, by publishing it, you know, on, on my Instagram post or something like that and just see how something feels when I put it out there. But I, um, I tend to just let a, a, an idea for a book percolate for a while. And it usually starts talking to me. I know that sounds a little woo woo, but it just, it starts like informing my brain, like, oh, this would be an interesting way of structuring the table of contents and what, and this, you know, this title or whatever. So it, it just tends to start speaking into my consciousness. And then I start, I, I, I'm a huge believer in um, an outline. You know, when you, when you have a healthy outline, you can see if you have a book in front of you that makes sense. And so I always spend a lot of time with that and just seeing if it works. And uh, once I've got a healthy outline, I've usually written the introduction. And then from there, it's just a matter of filling in the spaces and doing the research and things like that. Now, that sounds like a good plan. So do you ever get writer's block or what do you think of it? Because I know some writers, I know there's actually no such thing as writer's block as long as you just get in the in front of the computer or however you write and just start writing. But how is that for you? Like, do you procrastinate at all? Or is it like, OK, once you've got a book deal, you've got the idea for the book, you've got the book deal. Like, do you have a set process of like time that you sit and just write whatever? Like, how does that kind of work? I, I. I often get writer's block <laughs> and I often procrastinate for sure. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I think that's, let's just pause there. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's just so helpful for people who are perhaps new to writing or really want to, that someone as amazing as Kathy with all those books, she gets writer's block of procrastination. Okay. Oh, God, yes. And I'm, <laughs> it's actually a miserable process. It's like, I'm not, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, it's always, I always sort of, think that the process is going to be easy. It's like, oh, this book will be a dream. I totally know how to write this. I know exactly what I want to say. And, and then you get in there and it's like, what was I thinking? This is so hard. <laughs> but I take a lot of time on sentences and the, the flow and the cadence of a sentence, you know, and it just sort of, it, sometimes it, sometimes when I'm really blocked, it's, it's uh, because I'm not meant to write about that thing. Like I was writing quantum wellness a few books back and I was going to talk about various chemicals that are really important to avoid in your food and your, you know, building materials and all that stuff. And I spent weeks researching and trying to write it. And it was just so arduous. And finally I said, that I don't know why it took me so long. I figured I finally realized, Oh, it doesn't really fit into this book. It just doesn't fit into this book. And I was like, you know, don't have to do that anymore. So sometimes the block is that you haven't quite landed on what is the right thing to uh, talk about. It's not part of the um, book and you just don't realize it yet. Um, but normally, so my process is I get up in the morning, I have tea and breakfast, and I do, you know, emails and all, all kinds of stuff first thing in the morning. And I, I spend two hours just having tea and all of that stuff. And then I, I'll um, work out. 
I either go for a five mile run or I'll work out in a home gym or I'll do something online, one of those you know classes online. And I shower up, I have a little snack and then I'm off right around noon, I start uh, working. And so usually I work for about four hours on a writing project. And after that, you know, you don't want to, as a writer, I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't, you can't grind it because it's still a creative process. So um, it's not the same as like, okay, I could paint my walls all day long, or I could stay on this project all day long. Um, with writing, you just lose that creative juice if you go at it for too long. So I'm good usually for about four hours and then I'll piddle around with other stuff like social media or, you know, stuff that needs to be done around the house, things like that. But yeah, no, it's good. Thank you, Michelle. I think it's good to get an insight into how, yeah, different people operate. I love that you actually start kind of writing around noon because, you know, there's some people that say, oh, you know, to be successful, you've got to get up at like four in the morning and you've got to do all this stuff in the early morning. But I'm like you, I'm not really a super early morning person. So I kind of start with emails and, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And then I kind of get into my groove about similar sort of time. Yeah, to you. So that's interesting yeah. to, to know yeah. that. Yeah, you have to know your own rhythm. You know, you just have to know what works for you. It doesn't work for everybody. And I, I would like to say that I get up and right out of the gate, but I just I just don't. It's like my yeah. brain needs to wake up and do its thing. And I want to, you know, really kind of, you know, things occur to you. You put things together. And, and it's also as a writer, I think it's really important to allow yourself to daydream a little bit. Yes. And I, I love the process of, you know, getting outside and being in nature when I'm running or hiking. And, you know, that's when things start to occur to you. It's like it's like the it's like the the chaotic symmetry of nature it just trains your brain to, or not trains it, but sort of opens up your brain to sort of let things little synapses connect. And it just works for me to um, not be too disciplined. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. So your latest book, it's actually a collaboration with Jean Stone. So what's that like writing with another author? Wonderful. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Um, what's it like writing with another author? How does that work? Like, you know, you're constantly on meet. Yeah, tell us a bit about yeah. that. Well, and you asked me my process, by the way, um, which differed over over COVID because usually I am alone all day and I'm just sort of itching to connect with people and I am an introvert, but I still need human connection. And so usually what I would do is I'd go out at night either to a restaurant or meet someone at a bar, you know, when I'm not like a club bar, but just out for a glass of wine or go over to someone's house or have someone coming over here. But of course we couldn't do that for COVID. Um, Jean and I are very good friends. We're really, really close. We've been close for years and we've always wanted to do something together. And um, this was his idea for the book. He, he said, you know, there there have been lots of books about how to go vegan, vegan cooking, all the health stuff and the environmental stuff and the ethical stuff. But the, there's been no book that just has all the reasons that are really a, a book that's helpful for vegans and advocates and people who are into the environment because we're not all walking, talking databases of like, you know, how does yeah, animal agriculture affect, you know, climate change? What are the status, you know, statistics and everything? And, and so Jean and I thought, let's put it all in one place and make it easy for activists to give out to people um, so that they don't have to remember every medical scientific fact, you know, it's all in one place. But anyway, so Jean and I, what we did is we basically kind of fired off a bunch of reasons that we both really got behind and we divided them up 50 50. And we sort of went into our own quarters and we wrote the book, you know, and then what we did is with probably every maybe five chapters. And when I say chapter, no chapter is more than a page and a half. And most of them are less than a page or a page and we would trade pages and we would, you know, sort of edit each other's work. And then it would, you know, go back and we'd go back and forth that way until, um, until it got to the editor and then our editor had her say in it. And we just sort of, we argued about a few things like, you know, what <laughs> we thought was important. Like he, he would get mad at me sometimes because he said, that is such a, a female way of saying it, you know, <laughs> do, do not respond to 
to that. And I'm like, well, there there are women reading this book too. So <laughs> good to be you. Have all the different voices that we we tried to blend, but it was it was really fun. We're we're great friends, and it it just brought us even closer. Fabulous. How did you come up with the 72 reasons? Like, Everyone, how did you decide on that number? Is this like a magical number that we came up with? <laughs> yes. and until we got to the place where, okay, if we keep going, we're going to start repeating ourselves. So there were genuinely 72 independent, really good reasons to be vegan. Like that, that don't overlap. We're not saying the same thing over and over again in different ways. And, but, and we wanted to, be like um, uh, some serious facts and figures, like I talked about, like global climate change or heart disease, or you know, you get erections and sexual health and all of that stuff. But we also wanted it to be fun. We wanted it to be about, hey, by the way, martinis are vegan, and you know, coffee is vegan, and and um, and we wanted it to be uh, about relationships. We wanted it to be about spiritual practice. We wanted it to have something for everyone mm -hmm. so that it's all, not all heavy and not all light. It's just, and we wrote it for the ADD brain because, you know, I think so many people, we were just inundated as, as consumers of information that were inundated with blog posts and, you know, social media posts and, um, different newspapers and, you know, sort of news shows, everything. We So we just wanted to keep it short, concise, uh, an easy, fun, fun read with as much bottom line information as we could without exhausting the reader. We didn't want to be like just going through this whole long thing. We want to respect people's time and keep it brief and keep it solid. And that's what we did. Wonderful. So it's a fabulous book. So vegans and vegan advocates, great to get to give out, as you say, to family, friends to, to have a read. So that's 72 Reasons to be Vegan by Kathy Freston and Jean Stone. So before we wrap up, Kathy, our final section, I've got a little kind of rapid fire question. So basically, I'm going to ask you a question. You just answer in maybe one sentence or, you know, maybe a couple of short sentences, but kind of little rapid fire ones. OK, okay. we ready. Yep. What's the most courageous thing you've done? Uh, give a TED talk, TEDx. Ah, nice, nice. <laughs> what does leadership mean to you? And what kind of leader or style of leader do you believe you are? I think really healthy, um, uh, effective leadership is leading by example and, um, and, and being the thing that you're asking people to become. Mm, to model it. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, what do you most love about yourself? Oh, uh, <laughs> my open heart for animals. I love that about myself. Amazing. What's one thing that most people probably wouldn't know about you? Uh, that I love <laughs> DC. That you love what? ACDC. Oh, okay. I wouldn't have guessed that. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and then finally, what would you say have been or perhaps a couple of key lessons that you've learned that you would love to share with other vegan women leaders? Mm. Um, talk to people the way that you want people to talk to you because we're, we all have a common thread of wanting to be seen and witnessed and respected. So if you, if you talk to anyone, whether it's a business deal or someone you're trying to you know, speak into for this movement, Speak to them like you would want to be spoken to. And that's the most effective way of doing mm, it. I love that. That's an absolutely great tip. Kathy, it's been so lovely speaking with you. Everyone, do check out Kathy's website, which is kathyfreston.com. You can find out heaps of information about there's a list of all her books, as well as the latest one that I mentioned. She's got some amazing books. I know I've got some on my shelf, Quantum Wellness, 72 Reasons to be Vegan, lots of others. You can check out um, all of Kathy's work and links to her socials. Kathy, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was awesome to speak with you. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Bye for now. <laughs>